What's going on, guys? It's Frito here for your Overwatch The Group Up podcast interviewed the two most prominent Overwatch 2 developers yesterday. Aaron Keller, which most of you should know, is the game director, but also Alec Dawson, who's not only the lead hero designer, but now is also the lead gameplay designer, which I think we now may know more of what that means, having seen him do things under that position, as well as talk about what we'll see longer term. This is a very different vision to Overwatch than we've seen before and the sky's kind of the limit on what they're willing to do i'll go through summarizing what was said in the interview highlighting the key takeaways of what we can expect looking into the future of the game as well as discuss some of my thoughts on where they're going the first point was on rebuilding the reputation of overwatch aaron keller said that they believe they're only as good as your last release meaning they have to just continuously update do more things and try what they're calling big swings. That's a term they used a few times in the interview, alluding to bigger systems, more complicated features, things that are outside of the regular cadence of maps and heroes. They did portray some confidence, albeit I'll say in a bit of an understated way, because remember, this is largely a new team that inherited Overwatch 1, transitioning it in many ways towards a more competitive game, as well as a free-to-play, always-on, always-updating type title. Alex says they feel like the new team is getting better. I think perhaps perhaps pointing to Juno, who is one of the new designed heroes that seems to be getting universal acclaim, but also pinpointing a map like Runasapi, the new push map, which is designed with a lot of the early lessons they learned from that game mode when it was a bit simpler back in the day. Then, of course, applying those lessons to the map reworks. Certainly, Coliseo being more opened up has really helped gameplay on that map. They talked about the identity of the game. While it's not as casual as Mario Party, it isn't entirely competitive either, and especially as we we get through some of the types of things they're willing to look at down the line. I think we really get that blend of how they're looking to service both interests. Aaron goes on to say that the right decision can change from time to time, as in they felt like it was right to launch Overwatch 1 with the open queue format, where it was a lot more zany, casual, fitting the player base that they had at the time. But it also was the case that they did need to work towards role queue. I'm not a fan of them using this type of wording, because it's a convenient way for them to always be right? Well, how could we ever be wrong if the right thing changes fluidly whenever we want it to? Right, okay. But of course, the general philosophy is correct. They have to make decisions and change based on the audience they have, which is why we're going down the route to maybe make the game even more complicated, whether that is 6v6 or with all of these extra additions that they're floating. They expanded out and gave some examples of the things they're thinking about. We can organize this based on understanding they're looking to increase both the strategic depth and the individual player agency. Pickable passives was like a small version of that, less a system they were trying to implement and more of a test to try to gain feedback on how players interact with making those types of choices. I was excited to hear that they actually have tested the individual heroes passives. To the extent people were interested in the pickable passives, it seemed a lot of people had the same take as me that if we're going to do them, it should be hero specific, and they seem to already have been testing that. Alec talks about things that are both more competitive than ranked, but also less serious than the modes we currently have. It gave more concrete examples for the tryhardy things that we already know about. Maybe just like touching base on this, considering we've been talking about the next series of things for years now. That's a little triggering for me, but they're talking more seriously now about map voting, hero bans, and tournaments. Whereas before he said that when they spoke about these, it was more of a nice thing that they might try to get to eventually soon TM. Now that seems to be on a more realistic timetable, like it's in play as opposed to an aspirational stretch goal. Goal, especially since the competitive game is kind of all we got. There's not a big PvE game lurking in the back. And it's been a while that that's been the case, hasn't it? So let's see some of these things, shall we? Of course, aside from that, they're looking for big bets they can take and maybe even things that expose Overwatch outside of the regular realm of players that they already appeal to, which of course, you know, was the PvE idea or a TV show or even more casual modes, let's say. They seem to make it clear that they're looking to make it a priority to enhance the social experience of the game. Does that mean clans eventually? They didn't say that 
to finish the bingo card. They go on to agree that quick play is too sweaty and they're going to look to try to rein that in a bit somehow because they want it to feel like a pickup game and not as try hardy as ranked. And those lines can be blurred a little bit. They don't seem confident that simply adding a extra unranked or less sweaty queue will do much. So who knows what they're going to do to solve that. They talk about counter picking. And on one hand, do state that it is a skill check in the game and even goes so far to say they never want hero lock never is a strong word and whereas the old overwatch team might say never on a few things they said never on no limits which did not last long they do want fluid hero swapping in the game but i've tested with some ideas to maybe earn your swaps or limiting them as time goes on and the hero roster gets bigger i dislike hero swapping more and more because the number of mechanics that any player has has to keep in mind could be in their game at any given time is overwhelming but perhaps there's a middle point here he gave a few interesting stats on hero swapping he said it happens most in platinum diamond almost never in bronze and less so at the higher tiers because maybe there's more one tricks on average tank and dps players swap the same amount about once per game which again is just an average but the surprising stat was that support players swap about half of that amount of time which i think is absolutely nuts and if you want evidence that our community doesn't know how to actually swap around the game that would be it because support is my highest tiered role and i definitely swap in order to fix or counter the enemy all the time it's really easy very powerful and apparently the community doesn't know how powerful that is i think the reason is a combination of either the social pressure but also the ignorance of the player base as in it's easy to play support and kind of vaguely be in the back and somehow point the finger at someone else that they need to do more meanwhile you have all of the mechanics in your role to adjust to the situation but somehow it's not so simple i guess where it's like well i can go this dps to counter the tank or i can go this tank to counter the tank Meanwhile, the supports influence it just as much as any of the other roles. And I would say even more so because a lot of their mechanics are actually easier than some of the DPS or tank mechanics. But maybe that's just one man's opinion. But hey, don't take my word for it. You can send in your replay code still for season 11 into the link below for the Google Form submission page. I've still been in the collection and curation process. I think my next goal is to make even better, more complete guides, which is something I haven't done in a while, pretty much in the sequel. And I think those will really help you guys out. There's a lot of game knowledge that is lacking in our community. And I think it's been due to the TikTok understanding that it seems our player base has for Overwatch 2 5v5. Speaking of support changes, Life Weaver is getting changes in the next season, which I don't know if he just means balance or some playstyle adjustments. We'll see. Hopefully some offensive play would be nice. Now, they go into more depth to talk about hybrid roll queue. This is something they teased in the 6v6 developer blog. One idea might be a max two format, which already is a thing you can do in custom games, which basically means you load in and whoever selects a role kind of gets it first. But the odd idea, which I found a bit surprising, surprising is that maybe they could have the team comps dynamically flex in 5v5 as in you might have one of any of the three roles one tank or one damage or one support and the way that they would offset that is maybe give that individual player somehow a bonus added stats and power to compensate for being the one player in that role maybe a simple way would be a general stat boost and some added passives kind of a crazy idea and you can see how maybe if they're considering 6v6 as a better high-end competitive game this dynamic flex max 2q would be probably better suited for a casual experience to just make matches faster and allow you to swap roles perhaps or at the very least make more creative team compositions in the game without it getting too crazy six dps not really the experience people expected from overwatch which i think people forget was the case in overwatch one for years many games were just kind of unplayable thanks to the number of dps players you'd have now in general they're moving forward with 5v5 and aim to try to find a balanced state that is as widely renowned as the october patch from Overwatch 1. To add to Aaron's point there, with it coming so many years down the line, like how many years of development before we see like the peak of what 5v5 can be? Of course, not everyone's going to agree, but as Alec Dawson says, the queue times have gotten better since the season 11 balance patch. 
Now on to talking about 6v6 and the experiments that are forthcoming. They stated that they understand why the community would want the mode to return, especially if you are a tank player or an off tank who used to get to take off angles, go for more flank plays. Now tank gameplay is much more homogenous where you have to hold the main front line usually always. They talked about the social pressure of everybody wanting you to swap, but of course, as the data pans out, supports are nowhere near swapping as much as they should, considering how much power they have to influence the tank battle themselves. I can tell you that for free as a support player. And some general thoughts on 6v6, they're in investigation mode where they're trying to collect data, kind of understand the lay of the land. They went through a few different scenarios or timelines of how it could go down. If it has overwhelming popularity, they're going to respond with all hands on deck. And I say this to you guys with all the love in my heart, if you want this mode to succeed, you better even out those queue times as best as y'all can. When these tests come out, clear your schedules, cancel your dates, don't show up to work. You need to give them the data that this matters because as they say, if it isn't so popular, then they'll have to have a more of a nuanced take on it. Like how much effort should they put towards it? They talked about the open queue format, which has about 10% of all player playtime, which isn't insignificant. But if they have to entertain the idea of having multiple queues, it gets kind of tricky. And I think we all know that the best balancing and design goes towards the main game mode. And if it's relegated as a side mode, that's not what 6v6 players want. So get in there and play it when these tests do come out. They talked about the technical side of it or the workload around it. First of all, they're working through making it optimized for 6v6. Obviously, you can play it in customs now, but it's not optimized for a wide scale game on all the platforms it's on. But they don't seem to think it's going to take so much work if they do pull the trigger to do it, because it's more going to be taking away abilities rather than adding or reworking many. But they will do a visual pass to try to make sure there's not too much visual clutter with two more players on the field. Aaron made an interesting point that sometimes when a player is overloaded, it doesn't matter if they're a little overloaded or way overloaded. They're just overloaded. If there's too much on screen, you're not tracking any of it. It isn't like a sliding scale. You just hit that one point of no return and it's utter chaos. I think a lot of people who like 6v6 probably feel that way. And the few percentage points of it being more manageable in 5v5 doesn't really bear out. Also, I'm of the opinion that because the threats can come from so many different positions on the map, I find 5v5 actually harder to operate in. So on this point, I actually think the slow death ball -y, poke at the choke gameplay of 6v6 was way easier to understand at least most of the time. Because if you did go off on your own, you got blown up anyway. So it was mostly two death balls fighting rather than everyone being a playmaker at the same time from different angles and different positions and who knows which ability or ult is going to pop off. That's how 5v5 feels. Way more of a shooter game where anyone can have an impact. Whereas in 6v6, well, you're kind of just staring at the tanks and hopefully one pushes the other out of the way to make space, which is the gameplay we all missed. Right, guys? An additional 6v6 tidbit is that the South Korean region generally seems, according to the developers, to want us to get over the past and just move forward with 5v5. Those regional differences are always kind of interesting to investigate. Obviously, they have to develop the game for everybody anyway but south korea is such an interesting region itself because they're all the best players and they often have very different attitudes towards the formats of the game there were always big proponents of open queue playing it in large numbers even in competitive open queue when it was a side mode they seem as a region to be much more open-minded to the byproducts of any of these formats that maybe yields to obnoxious gameplay i also think that region tends to have a much more complete understanding of Overwatch, whereas even at the higher tiers in North America, the expected base strategy and approach to the game tends to be expecting the path of least resistance, whereas the Koreans tend to view the game of the path to the highest peak potential output, which is why they typically favor skill shots and high output, high execution comps such as dive, even in metas where it might be hard to play dive. So long story short, they'll be adapting their effort and workload to 6v6 based on the player interest that's shown. Willing to essentially go all in on it, if that seems to be the right call. Keep in mind, I think it will do very well to begin because it's different enough and rare enough. As in, you couldn't play that version of the game for years. And for the novelty alone, people will come back and play it. But is that sustainable for the long term? That's why they're going to have to do multiple tests 
for longer durations than just a weekend. And while they have some ideas cooking on queue times, apparently, they didn't really say many other than to state an interesting byproduct of why priority passes didn't work in Overwatch 1. Because as it turns out, even if you improve queue times for DPS, the thing you get is more DPS players. So while we did get more tank players filling to get passes to play DPS, we got even more DPS players to outweigh the benefit mathematically. This is sort of like when you add more lanes to a highway, more people go out to drive. So like the demand for the thing scales with the supply, which isn't how we would intuitively assume that should work but is how the behavior panned out in the end. Seeing a lower queue time on damage incentivizes more players to go play damage like in the future, creating more damage players over time. That's pretty insane. And trust me, it's one of those systems I really hoped would work. I remember asking for such a system because I wanted that beautiful two tank gameplay just for myself. I was there. We wanted them to develop ways in order to make everything work at the same time. And it turns out you can't. So as the devs say, maybe there is players that are willing to wait for the queue times, which undoubtedly will not be good. We will have to see. We'll have to see if enough players want to go play the killable tank role, whereas opposed to playing the Giga tanks in Overwatch 2, who have a slew of hero shooter buttons. Instead, the 6v6 tanks will have to be tuned down to require resources from your teammates, which of course in gold always goes on to you as you expect. I, can't, I really can't wait for this test to come out, guys. Like, can you tell? Like, I'm super excited, actually. Because really, it's all winning for me. Either they're going to make 5v5 better, or they put the game back to 6v6, and the game is way more about strategy, which is where I make my best content. So either way, I'm pretty happy. Guys, that's everything for today's wrap-up video. What did you think of the interview? If you watched the full thing, let us know in the comment section down below if you're excited about the direction they're going with the game. The devs seem confident that they're far more able to develop this game than ever before, as they've trained up with uh, on-the-job training, I suppose. So I hope we can see some momentum with the PvP focus in like the next year. Now that the devs are kind of reaching their final form, solidifying the identity of this game, no longer in the training wheels process of trying to get the sequel off the ground or stumbling with some of the aspects they had to gut. Now it's time to put up or shut up, guys. Because we've heard about teasing of these systems and improvements and stuff for a long time now. Now it seems, according to Alec, they're actually going to do some of the things they should have done for years. <laughs> okay, great. And I do agree that they seem to be getting better over time. And I look forward to covering what they have next. If you enjoyed the video, please be sure to leave it a like. And don't forget to click subscribe and the bell icon to actually get notified when our videos come out. That's been it for me. I've been Frito for your Overwatch. I'll see you guys next time.